Hey everyone, and welcome back to FDC Crash Course Programming. Today's episode is going to be about the FDC SDK. After today's episode, you'll be able to take what you learned about Java last episode and use it to program in FDC as you'll understand the platform that you're going to be able to be using to program. And so today's outline, we're first going to be going over what is an SDK in general and how does this FDC SDK actually allow you to program with um, with the control system in FDC without actually having to know how it works. And then we're going to take a tour of some important SDK classes and overall functionality. So that way in next week's episode when we start writing actual op modes and FDC code, you'll be able to um, know what's going on and kind of know how to where to look for more information. And then lastly, I'll be I'll be telling you how to use the um, the Java documentation for the FTC SDK so that you're able to then take this and then do some more learning and, and overall become much more comfortable with programming and on the FTC platform. So starting off, we're going to be talking about what is an SDK. So SDK stands for Software Development Kit. And this is basically a toolkit for programmers in a given environment or, or if they're working on a specific application. And this is going to consist of compiled libraries that were, that were written by other developers that that allow you to use high-level functionality um, in a in a given platform without having to know how it works. Kind of an example outside of FTC would be if you were creating an app for the Apple App Store. Um, Apple is going to be giving you a bunch of tools to work with iOS devices but without you having to go from scratch and have to worry about all these tiny um, details at, the, at a very low level. And so in FTC, the SDK is going to consist of several libraries, well, one main big one, and then these libraries were written by the people who developed the control system, and these libraries are going to allow you to interface with the FEC control system in, in, in an abstracted and in a very easy to use and high level manner. And so people have decompiled and uploaded these libraries because right now when you download the SDK and you've got these libraries, they're gonna be compiled. So you can't just so you can't view them directly. But people have decompiled them and uploaded them. So if you want to look at how these libraries are written and kind of all the low level stuff, if you're interested, feel free to do that. I'll probably put a link somewhere in the description. And so basically what the SDK lets you do is you don't have to know all the complicated low level code about talking to a rev hub or managing event loops. All you have to know is how to use the SDK and it's very self-explanatory and easy to use in order to program an FTC. So now we're going to jump into an SDK tour. Before we start the tour, I'm going to do a quick preface um, about some things that maybe I didn't mention in my Java video that's going to be pretty useful to know as we go, as we go through this documentation. So first is that since the SDK was written in Java, of course, this tour is going to make a lot more sense if you watch last week's episode, the, the normal Java basics, or if you have brief experience in Java. If you, if you do not know Java, definitely check that out. Um, just make sure that you have a general understanding because it's going to be hard to follow and see how this applies to FTC programming if you don't know Java yourself when, you're working, when, you're, when we're going through this. And so now moving on, it's common practice in Java, especially in libraries, um, to make properties of classes private, which means that um, you cannot access them outside the class. So say if your own class, you make an instance of like a motor object, you would not be able to access that motor's power variable. It's private. However, these things still have to be exposed so that you can use them in the SDK. And how this is done is through getter and setter methods. And so for example, say if you wanted to make the user be able to change the power of a motor, you would create a set power method. And then this generally prevents someone from changing something that would like break the code that they don't want to change. And this overall process is called data encapsulation. And you'll see this a lot in the um, in the library that we're going to be looking through called Robot Core um, because it is a it is a generally professionally developed library that and that adheres to Java convention. And so classes, um, something else I didn't mention is classes and methods can be abstract, which means that the end user, which is going to be you programming, has to override them and put their and put their own code or values in there. So basically, the, the FTC developers can force you to put your, your own code in somewhere. And this is going to make a lot of sense when we talk about op modes where you're, where you're going to be putting your code and so you can't act, so you can't just run nothing. And then how you how you do override things is through the at override annotation. I will show you an example of this in the episode when we do actual code, but just kind of keep that in mind of how you actually need to be overriding these things. And the last thing I'm going to mention is in enumeration. 
Uh, this is called, um, it, it, in code it's going to be written as enum. Basically an enumeration is just a way to give names to values. Um, and so basically it is like you're a custom, like a custom data type and it kind of constricts the input to say like a function to a certain list of things. So like say if I wanted to restrict the user from only being able to, to set the motor forwards or backwards, I can I can quickly create a, a new type called direction that has the options of forward and backwards without having to be very obscure or something like one is forward and zero is backwards. So it makes code a lot more readable. Okay, so the first class that I'm gonna be talking about is DC motor. And of course, this this class corresponds to a actual DC motor that you will be connecting to your robot. And there are a couple of, of key methods that you'll have to know with this. As I mentioned, for most of these classes, I'm not even gonna mention the properties because they're generally backend stuff and they're gonna be exposed to you through these getter and setter methods. So first off, is set power. It takes a double power and this power is gonna be going from negative 1.0 to 1.0. Of course, 1.0 would be full power forward, negative 1.0 would be full power backwards, and then all those values in between and zero would be the motor would be off. And of course, there is get power as well, but generally for a lot of these things that you're going to be setting, you don't really care about getting it back because you're the one setting it in the first place. So this next one is set direction. Um, both of these actually direction and power are from a different class called DC Motor Simple, which DC Motor inherits from. Once again, back to the idea of, of inheritance. And the options for, so, and so the parameter of set direction is from an enumeration with the options of forward or backwards. So pretty straightforward there. Um, you call that and it'll set your motor be forward or backward. This is useful so you don't have to keep using negative or it doesn't really make sense. And then next up is set zero power behavior. And this, this again takes in a custom enumeration parameter of zero power behavior from DC motor. And so this sets what your motor does when it when it gets a power of zero. You have two options here mainly. Uh, one is float, which means that the motor will just turn off and it'll coast freely. And there's also break, which means that when, when a zero when zero power is sent to the motor, it will actively resist any changes in motion. So it'll it'll, it'll act like a very weak brake on whatever you're doing. This is very nice with the drivetrain so that when you stop at something like autonomous, you'll get pretty controlled stop and not coast along if you were going fast beforehand. So next up is get current position. And this, and this is only going to be relevant to you if this given motor has its encoder plugged in. Uh, get current position will return an integer and this will correspond to the number of counts from the encoder and then, you'll, and then you'll do math on that to determine how many revolutions that correspond to of the motor's axle. And so next up is set mode and this may be the last one. Set mode it just has to do, this is again has to do with encoders. Uh, you, you have some options here. The main one is going to be run using encoder. This will try and match the pre-tuned PID controller so that the speed is the same regardless of voltage. It can be a, a bit finicky but Definitely try that out if you want to. And here, you can also set run with, without encoder, which is what you're gonna to wanna to do if there's no encoder and plugged in, because things get pretty weird if, they're, if you set it to using encoder. All right, so next class is going to be the servo. So the servo really only has one relevant method, and that is set position, it takes in a double position. Once again, well, this is just from zero to one. And so, for example, on a 180 degree servo, zero would be zero degrees all the way this way, and then 180 degrees would be all the way this way. And as I mentioned in my first video, servers are very nice because they deal with all of the complicated control loops of keeping the server at a given position without you having to deal with any of that with their onboard controller. And as a programmer, all you have to do is just give it a number from zero to one and it'll hold there and generally work very well. All right, and here's an example. Of course, there are a ton of sensors that you can use in FTC, and so I'll be talking about how to use this documentation of the SDK in order to figure out how to use whatever sensor you're using, but I'm just gonna be using a generic color sensor class here. And so it has methods to get the red, green, blue, and alpha channels of, of whatever the sensor is reading. And th there's also some other stuff in here, um, as, with all as with all classes really, that you don't have to worry about as much, but could be useful to you. Um, but some of these are gonna be um, rolling over from older versions of the software, like I2C addresses, now you don't have, now you don't have to worry about because all the I2C controllers are separate. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much that. And so now that you've seen some examples of the actual hardware classes themselves, you're probably wondering how you would set these up and, and, and get them constructed because as my last video, when we made our own custom class, we just created our own constructor and we used that. However, in FTC, you're, you're going to be inside an op mode, and that op mode is going to give you a hardware map object that it makes behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about how that, how that happens. 
and pretty much the only method they're going to be calling on this object is get. And so the get method will take in the type that you want to look for if you want to specify that. So for example, I would do dcmotor.class. And then the second parameter is going to be the name. And so on your phone, you're going to be set, you're going to be making your hardware map where you map the name of each of your hardware components to a, to its port number on the on the rev hubs. And then once it's all set up, you just mirror that when you're using the hardware map on in your code. And then that way it, it'll be able to find what what device you're talking about and assign that to whatever variable you're making with the hardware device type. All right, and so now we're going to be moving on to a second class that you're going to be given already set up is the gamepad. Um, of course, you'll have two gamepads, up to two gamepads, and these gamepads don't actually use methods in order to get their um, properties just because things would get kind of weird. Um, they're not best practice, but it just makes things easier to read. Um, and so these are going to be directly exposed. You, you, like, you can actually change these values yourself, but you shouldn't. And so all these are going to be Booleans pretty much, except for the triggers. So for example, your A button is just going to be called A. And so using the, the axis modifier, you could do your gamepad.a, and you would get um, whether true or false, whether it's, being, whether it's currently being pressed. Um, and all those are going to be true or false, except for the triggers, which are going to be a float um, from 0 to 1, because the, the, the harder you press on those, the higher or, or lower value that you'll get back. So you can kind of do some coding based off of that if you if you want that to be how your robot is controlled via the gamepad. And then there's telemetry. Once again, this is also set up for you. It'll just be there for you ready to use. Um, te telemetry is what allows you to communicate data to the driver station from your code that's running. So that way you can kind of debug things and make sure everything's working properly. And the, pretty much the only method that you're going to be using here is add data. And so um, there's, there's several different add data um, parameter options. Um, I'm just going to be talking about the most common one, which is you put in a string, which is the caption, and then you can put any object in as a value. Generally, it's probably going to be want to be a number or a string, so that can be displayed properly on the driver station. And then the other method, um, well, for, for telemetry, you might have to manually update this depending on where you are. And um, I'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about autonomous. That's, for, this is that one, that's when this is going to be relevant, pretty much. And then you can also clear the telemetry. That's, that's another useful one. If, th if things are getting backed up, you can do dot clear. And so now we're going to be talking about probably the most important class in the FTC SDK, which is op mode. Um, this is where you're going to be putting your code, and it is how your your robot's going to be running a program. And op mode is basically a program that your robot can't run. And, you, and you, you're going to have a list of these on your driver station to choose from which one you want to run. And that's how you're going to be choosing what code to run on your robot, whether it's autonomous or teleop. And so here's the base op mode class. And so this op mode is an iterative op mode, which means that it's going to be constantly looping a certain um, piece of code over and over again, and you'll be getting new data from your hardware. It'll be doing hardware cycles, and you'll and so that's all taken care of for you. And so it's going to provide you, as I mentioned, with a gamepad one object, a gamepad two object, a hardware mapped object, and a telemetry object. These are all set up. You don't have to worry about them. You, you just use them. But it does also give you an abstract method called init with no return as terms void and it also gives you an abstract method called loop and so you have to override these two methods otherwise your code will not compile inside the init you're going to be putting in all your hardware setup that's what's going to run when you're present init on your phone of course and then in loop you're going to be putting in the code that's going to be ran over and over again generally for tele out this makes a lot of sense how they could be looping and there are some other methods that you that you can override actually too you don't have to do these but you can there's init loop this one will run um, over and over again after you press it the first time, just init only runs once. And then start will run right when you press play once, and stop will run once when you press the stop button. So that's kind of more information if, you, if you're there. And then there's linear op mode, which is which actually does inherit from op mode, but it's set up a little bit differently. Linear op mode is geared towards op modes that are mainly that can be ran linearly, of course. So like autonomous is the main thing I can think of here. Although some teams do do use this in um, teleop and kind of have their own system for managing loops. I don't recommend you do that. You probably want to stick with the op mode for teleop just because it's, it's doing everything for you and it's generally pretty good at managing loop times. And so linear op mode overwrote a knit and loop behind the scenes, don't have to worry about that. All you have to override now is an abstract method called run op mode. And so this is this will be pretty much run only once. It's not gonna be looped, it's just gonna go in order and when it's done, the op mode stops. And then the, and it gives you a method called wait for start. And so this is kind of like a different system. You'll be calling this and the code will halt until someone presses start. So if it, after you set up your hardware, you'll call this and you'll be waiting until someone presses start and you'll start running through. And lastly, in linear op mode is that you get the method of sleep. And so sleep allows you 
to kind of halt your code and wait for a given time. The parameter is a long, which is just a, um, a bigger kind of number type um, in milliseconds. Um, so you kind of, you'll, you'll put that time in milliseconds and your code will wait that amount of time and then continue on. You could technically implement this in teleop, However, if your teleop loop stops for more than like 250 milliseconds, your code will crash, and so doing release is not advised and want to be kept to a linear op mode. It's not going to be looping over and over again. Okay, and so that pretty much concludes our tour of the FTC SDK. And so now the last thing that I'm going to be talking about is how you can look through and learn more about the SDK uh, as you use it and as you're programming. Um, because generally, you don't want to have to memorize all this stuff. You want to pretty, and you, you want to have a handy reference that you can use and kind of as you have questions as you want to do things you can look them up and what's, what's great is that when the fdc team was, was creating this sdk they used a lot of documentation annotations and comments and so that allows them to just generate something called a java doc and this is and this is generally um i believe it is pre-generated and it's going to be inside the SDK when you download it. There was a bit of an older version currently hosted on a github.io site. I'm not entirely sure if it's, if it's updated or not, but I'll link it just because there have been too many, too many just huge changes since that, that, um, that was last updated. And so with these, with these Java docs, you're able to kind of step through and look at each class, look at the methods that are exposed to you from each class, and also read comments about what each one does. And it's generally very well documented, so definitely use this as you're coding, keep it handy. Um, it, it definitely answers pretty much all questions that you could have about what different functionality there is. And yeah, just make sure this is updated. I'll be putting some links below so you can easily find this and download it or just use the host one if you want to look through. As you'll see, when, when you go into this Java doc, it's gonna be organized first by um, the overall uh, library. Um, so the the main one's called Robot Core, and the, and it has sub packages like um like hardware, and so you, you can click through those um on the sidebar that those be a list of all the classes are kind of organized by their package, and then when you when you click on those there'll be a list of the properties exposed by the classes as well as the methods exposed for public use. And then you can read through the comments and kind of and, and, and see the parameters and return types and all of that. And so you so you'll have a very good understanding of what, what everything does and you'll be ready to go when you get to programming. And that pretty much wraps up our episode on the FTC SDK. Your homework for today is to just open up the Java doc and start looking through it. Um, go through any classes that you, that you think seem useful. Definitely look at the ones that I mentioned that are going to be pretty important, like the DC motor, op mode, telemetry, and, and all of that, and kind of look through the, the other methods that, that are available. Um, and just and do understand that not, not all these methods that they list you're probably ever going to be using, but they are there, and they definitely could have a use if you if you think of a of a application where they'd be useful, and, and they're all there for you to use. So that's pretty much it. Take a tour. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions at the email address and our Twitter below in the description, and I'll see you all next week.